Hi all, today is Tuesday, January 25th, 2022. This is the KCP community meeting. Uh, the link to the community meeting agenda here is in the chat. I'll paste it again just in case you all need it. And please feel free to add agenda items and we will get started going through them. So first up, we have a prototype off demo. So I will turn it over to you, Serge. Okay, thanks. Um, so let me share my screen. Okay, so I was tasked um, with prototyping some initial um, authorization schemes where we could show if the work that we have been doing so far, and effectively we have been piggybacking on your work, Andy, while you were on vacation on the Sculpt branch, which worked great, by the way. And um, I prepared like an initial document. We have a couple of more user stories down here for future work, but basically for the sake of this demo, I'm focusing on sort of like three simple user stories. Um, so to say, like if you have a user one, <laughs> I want to create config maps in workspace one as I have added permissions. And as user two, I want to view config maps in workspace one as I have view permissions. Um, and there's some other random user if I don't have any access to it, um, I can't see anything, basically, right? Um, so this is pretty much what I would expect from a tenant-aware system like, like KCP. And we had some initial brainstorms, and huge thanks to Stefan and David. Uh, we had a couple of design sessions, pair programming sessions, and all of this, what you see here right now, is this collaborative effort um, from within this group. The basic scheme that we have, like, thoughts about is to have, like, um, three basic authorizers that we hook into KCP, similar um, as Upstream does. And that one is what we call a workspace content voter. I will just um, describe in a second what this concretely means. Essentially what this one does, it basically asserts if the user in flight has um, basic or like rudimentary access to the workspace and does some um, initial group assignments. What that means, I will um, get into a, to a second. Then we will have like a union of two um, additional authorizers, one that we called local um, voter, that one spans out to the actual workspace that the user has in the scope uh, and the request in flight, and one is the organizational voter, which we use something like as a bootstrap policy source, right? So when you look at this like from a higher level perspective, um, help this is good enough let me share maybe the concrete window instead. I think this should work better. Um, so let's say you have a cube cuddle um, and it does some basic operation like config map, uh, could be anything. Um, so we have a concrete scope, um, the request in flight in this case, it would be like a workspace one and the obvious operation would be get config map. So the first authorizer that would kick in is this what we call a content authorizer. Um, and the scheme we thought of is that it makes sense to separate the basic RBAC rules against the workspace resource type that is working on the resource uh, workspace resource object itself and separate the con concern of accessing the content to it into a separate RBAC rule, right? So what this content authorizer effectively does, um, it looks at the scope you're currently in. Um, it looks at the workspace resource um, and the sub-resource content and asserts if you're allowed to perform a couple of basic verbs on that um, you know, sub-resource content of the workspace uh, resource. Uh, and we literally, you know, just for the sake of the prototype, iterate through a couple of artificial verbs, edit view and admin. Um, well, administer, it should be like uh, spelled out as a, as a proper proper verb. And if you have access to one of those verbs, um, you get a group assigned that will map to some bootstrap policy um, in, inside your workspace. More formally, what we did is, you know, inside this organizational admin workspace, we have a couple of, um, cluster role bindings that we added into the bootstrap policy, where we map this edit, these artificial sort of like KCP groups, edit view and admin, at least for now to the stock upstream Kubernetes cluster roles, edit view and admin, you, pretty, you, you 
you know um, that these are they are by default these are aggregated roles. So if if the user in flight has any access to those verbs, it gets the groups assigned. Um, from those groups, we imply the cluster roles uh, by those bindings. And depending on what cluster role you implied against, uh, you have access to the content, literally to the content of, of the workspace, right? Those rules, since this is a union authorizer, maybe some of you uh, who know a little bit about the upstream RBAC, there is this concept of a union authorization. Essentially, it's just a change, uh, chain of authorizers. And um, uh, it, it, it takes sort of like literally mathematically the, the union of those authorizations that allows us to um, sort of like predefine a set of rules in the organizational workspace um, and override or augment um, those, oh, not override, but augment those uh, rules in the in the workspace and this concrete example, the workspace one. Um, and obviously, I'm, I just draw this here, the inherit from, I believe this is supposed to go away, the inherit from the relationship, but just for the sake of the demo to show that there is a relationship that the workspace one has um, an organizational workspace, in this case, admin. Um, so just to show it off in terms of a demo, let me share another window then. Like literally what you, what, once, what's, once all that code merges, what you could literally do right now is um, if you have a workspace, um, right, so I just, deployed this workspace one. Um, and you have a cluster role, right? And this this sort of like um, cluster role declaration is, is a concrete incarnation of, of the picture that I showed you. Like I just called this cluster role workspace one editor and this one bind, like this one uh, binds against workspaces slash content and the content sub resource, it's, it's just an artificial one that uh, we invented. Concretely for workspace one uh, against the verbs edit um, and the same, you know, corresponding, you have a workspace one viewer that binds against the uh, viewer verb, right? Uh, what you can then do is uh, you can create a couple of cluster row bindings. In this case, just as an example, workspace one editors, just for, you know, toying around with it. If like the Orbex subsystem sort of like works, I'm, I bound it against team one. Um, if you use the KCP tokens that we have, like as a, as a demo here, team one is a group associated oops, um, with the user one token. Um, and I created another uh, cluster role binding workspace one viewers uh, that binds against the concrete user, user two, who has the viewers uh, cluster role assigned to it, right? So um, just to show it, uh, I have this um, example here where I'm pointing against the workspace one with the user one total, get some um, config map, we, create, we can create a, config map foo, right? Config map is created. Since user two is assigned to the view role, it fails to do so, it has no permissions, which is great. But obviously since um, user two has a binding against the view role, it can read data from workspace one, um, in this case, config maps. And we have, if we have some user three, in this case user three token, right? It, it cannot do, essentially cannot do anything. Um, when you look at the code, uh, this is like how, how this prototype implementation looks like, right? So it's a regular authorizer. We heavily use the existing RBAC authorizer with the, you know, with listers who have the scope suffix that that's exactly the work that Andy did in his branch. And again, like we piggy picked on this branch. Um, and this is sort of like the outer shell, the outer workspace authorizer that I showed you in, in the pictures um, that looks, against the organizational workspace. In this case, it's just hard-coded admin. If you have um, permissions against those verbs, if you do have them, right, um, we just simply allow the decision and append those extra groups such that we can pass um, a new attributes record in the RBAC subsystem with the groups edit that I just showed you in the other picture. And then, delegate to the other authorizers, which are being passed here in the constructor as a union. Um, and this is essentially how it works, at least for the prototype. And um, I believe on master, this is not possible. You will just, uh, I, I believe, uh, David, when we tested this, just get a not permission or permission not allowed. Um, so but this is 
is just to show off that we can do some delegated authorization, that we can have some initial bootstrap policy present in the administrative workspaces, uh, and that we also can have um, the actual workspaces be effectively empty and just, you know, delegate uh, or back in, in that direction. Um, obviously, what is not possible here, what we have been thinking about is what if you have some cluster roles in the administrative workspace and you want to bind against them um, in the actual workspace? That's not possible because they live as in, in two separate entities. That's one edge case that is currently not covered here. The second edge case that we would have to consider is um, we should not be allowed to override one of those, you know, administrative uh, organizational um, cluster roles in your actual workspace because you could theoretically also redefine the view role to have much more access than it's supposed to be. Right. So I guess like there was there was still a couple of things to carve out. So wait, sir, um, sir, could you could yeah. you explain that one a little bit more? Like tease it out. So overriding a cluster role would be bad in the workspace because is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Because you could theoretically expand permissions or overwrite them. Yes. Bad because the workspace admin could destroy their workspace. Like, what's the what's the use case underpinning that worry? So the use case underpinning the worry is that when you have a user, I'm not talking about the admin, but if you have a user who has like full access on the actual workspace, so they're root on the workspace. Yeah, exactly. Destroy the workspace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He could he could sort of like override permissions that the admin gave to him, right? Uh, that's the concern that I have. So I think, and I think that's like the, think, this is the, who are we defending workspaces from in that case? I mean, could we tease that apart a little bit? We are defending against, I, I, you know, this is just hypothetical. I've been so busy implementing the prototype that, you know, I'm just making up edge cases here and finding no, and, and actually, right? So this is really, so like, this is useful right. because um, we had some theoretical about like inheritance to reduce cost. And right. as a result, we're thinking about the limitations of the cube RBAC model as it applies to this. And right. the right, it is now the right time to say, good, we've learned something, you're familiarized. Now we can start asking the next questions, which are what use cases uh, beyond efficiency would we want? And where does the current cube model not help us solve that? And then it starts, like we, we've got a couple of these noted down, but it's very useful to say like, okay, now you're primed. Now I'm gonna start asking about edge cases. So um, mm -hmm. we don't have to do it all here, but like some of the things I think maybe like a follow-up would be useful yeah. is like say, let's try to get some basic use cases that we think would be relevant based on what you've learned, ask whether they're valid or not. And then we can also start poking at the, what are the tools that we would need? Like inheritance as a technical thing versus union of org, mm -hmm. you kind of have that org workspace uh, administrative tooling mindset. What are the different things that we could assemble out of those pieces? What are the gaps? Um, so it's, I think it's a good setup point, which is partially why I was poking on it. Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm chasing a red herring here. Maybe it's even a valid use case to be able to override those cluster roles in the in the actual workspace. Definitely, um, and, I, right. And one of the questions I think was um, a lot of what uh, we don't have to have all the answers, but like, uh, is there a general primitive in inheritance that helps people think about? an organizational layering, a workspace layering, and a installation layering. Cube has that cluster and work namespace scopes, but those have very serious limitations in terms of actual security isolation, because at the time the use case didn't, we didn't need them because the point of a cube cluster is that it's a single homogeneous security domain with some subdivisions for limiting a subset of the permissions. Workspaces start from the opposite, which is a workspace is a hard security boundary. Mm. And how do we get the right things into it? And then how do we give someone the ability to connect them up? So it's totally about a fair question to ask. Uh, but, but the general question would be, is there an underlay mechanism of inheritance that is generally useful for the subsystems in cube or for other systems such as like, I want to make a resource appear in someone's workspace. Hmm. by default such that watch and all that work or do i want to have a virtualized system like RBAC, 
where we have to build that in for each concept. Um, so you're, you're kind of teeing up some of those important questions that we posed. We don't have to completely answer here, but we want to get that motion thinking about it. Uh, because virtualization is a virtualization and layering are both in, important for the perspective of reducing the friction people have when they're trying to set up systems of control. Right. It's not something uh, necessarily automatically enables by default today. Plus, yes. I'm just realizing the uh, the whole concept of a union authorizer, in addition, on top of inheritance, also like brings a connection between those two worlds. So we even have to consider even more use cases just by um, yeah, having something like a union authorizer, which brings in together uh, completely. Right. If, if you say completely two separate uh, units of, of security, it's already like a dangerous realm we are here in. Well, I, from a perspective, yeah. There's a set of use cases which we we won't we don't have to get into here, but they're around like there are properties of cloud accounts that are very desirable, such as no matter what, someone inside the workspace cannot exceed cannot uh, do certain things that are dangerous, and no one from the outside of that workspace, even the infrastructure administrator, can get into it without rooting the system. Right. So, like, think about. Uh, if you look at like how an AWS account is structured, there is a conceptual behavior there, which is even AWS employees do not necessarily have access to that AWS account because the way the system is designed, no one has access to that. Cube doesn't really have that property today. There is a question as a use case, whether we do it and getting this framing is like, what are the systems that we do? So we'll, we'll go through those use cases. A second thing, your point about authorizer, and this is really important is there is some discussion about um, models like broader RBAC identity systems, like a, a RBAC relational um, AC going on through, you know, a bunch of startups out there. Some people in the ecosystem talking about, you know, uh, could we bring the um, Zanzibar style models? And there's actually an active discussion going on, and uh, folks in this will be connected to some of those groups around. Is there a point where QBAR back kind of like it only accomplishes so much. And instead of programming QBAR back, when we're talking about sharing and inheritance, we're really talking about those relational things might be a better modeling uh, given the limitations. So having all the limitations in your head is extremely useful. Yes, I think these are completely valid concerns. I mean, obviously, for the prototype, we've been picky picking on what we have today, right? But I think it's a totally valid question to to look at Zanzibar like use cases and if we can, um, yeah, literally go crazy in, in, in the permissions model for for KCP as well. I think this is definitely worth exploring uh, in the next iteration. Yes, totally agreed. Okay. Um, any and, and then it would be good uh, as an out put as y'all are going is to document places where you felt like the limitations of the RBAC model were showing up. So just like uh, as a useful goal, frame it the problem as are there places where while this is a, a concept, can we familiarize ourselves with the reasons why it might be limiting um, as, a, as an input for what would be a, uh, a cut point where we could say, oh, like the, the inherited authorizers, they don't actually have to be implemented in cube. Um, they are a stand-in for a future replacement of the external auth. Whereas within a workspace, we do have to honor the cube semantics. Um, that's a good boundary within the workspace be, because of the, the we want to bring existing cube workloads over. We have to have roughly equivalent semantics outside the workspace. We do not, and so going through and starting that exploration from what's familiar. And how you could reuse the authorizers that we have to the next step, which would be plugging in or potentially just saying like we would uh, we would be willing to consider these and that the modeling might be different. Uh, open the door for people to do that because we have an interface layer, which is what's exposed in the workspace that end users can't touch. So they're great. Yeah, again. Yeah, great points. Thanks a lot. That would be all from my side. And uh, um, I think it's super nice because David already picky packed this work and made virtual workspaces work on top of it, I guess. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, thanks for the demo. That was really cool to see. Um, looking forward to getting that in on top of <laughs> my pending PRs, which are I've started uh, to go through and redo the commits so that they actually are a bit more 
uh, logically ordered and not just giant whip <laughs> commits. Um, all right, next up, we've got a demo Cut. from David. Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I saw some mentions of the shard proxy in there. Serge, were you, uh, so I guess where on the spectrum of like local replication to actually calling out and getting the data, were you expecting this to run? Uh, all for the prototype, I all ran this um, locally on a local KCP instance, and I just created a workspace shard uh, just to make it all work within the same process. But uh, once your PR um, merges, um, I think we have a little bit more um, stuff to do, namely to get the organizational workspace. Right, all of this is hard coded against admin right now. Okay. Make sense? Yeah. And I think, excuse me if I'm saying something wrong. I still knew. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's good. I, I think we might need to think through as well. We might still be hard coded in the future, just against the local copy of the org workspace. That makes sense. Okay. All right, David. Over to you for your demo. Yeah. Thank you. So mainly, I try to gather the various uh, elements there, the auth that Sergio just, just showed, uh, build that on top of uh, and these scoping, and then also include the personal, uh, you know, personal workspace, virtual workspace, with the last thing added, the cube config retrieval from uh, from KCP, and mix all this also to use a new cube CTL KCP workspace plugin that you know mainly those <clears throat> managing workspaces in a much nicer way for the users so let me share my screen here uh do you see my vs code got it yeah great so um here i'm going to work not directly pointing to as usual to the cube config uh, generated by kcp but just to a basic config that you can see um, below here. And yeah, well, I didn't yeah, clean it, but I mean, that would contain only this. This is the endpoint to the virtual workspace uh, server that you know I point to the personal endpoint that will show all my uh, workspaces by delegating to KCP to the KCP organization uh, organization workspace, and so um, based on this cube config, I can uh, do my first. You know, I can call. Yeah, here let me pass that. Use the <clears throat> kubectl KCP workspace, and here I have the various uh, options to create a workspace. And that will directly point to the virtual workspace endpoint and uh, post the right REST request there. And also get the current workspace delayed, list, and especially use, which is somehow similar to what you have with kubectl config um, use context, but here to use a given workspace. So if I try to uh, start creating a workspace with a given user, so here, let me do that by kubectl workspace, create workspace 11 with user one, um, the token of, of user one. I can do the same just after, uh, sorry, yeah, here to create a second one. And then I can just do kubectl workspace list with the same user. I get exactly the same thing as what you do if you point directly with kubectl, get workspaces on the uh, virtual, virtual workspace um, um, API server URL. Then let me try to also do a list, but with a different user. And of course, we can see that um, personal workspace endpoints are per user, and so we don't have any any uh, workspace available for uh, user two. Now I can also use workspace one, uh, workspace eleven. Sorry, and if I do that, 
and then do the current here. Yeah, I can see that now I'm really in this workspace. I can obviously check the um, current context because when I switch the workspace, what it does is um, it adds a context, typically something like that here, uh, that is specific to KCP and points to the right, uh, precisely to the uh, all the information that was retrieved from uh, the virtual workspace, the cube config of this um, uh, workspace, workspace 11 here. So if, if I do uh, kubectl config um, current context, then I can see that I'm pointing to that with the user one that I selected previously. Um, so let me now just do typic typical uh, kubectl work. And for example, here, create a secret. Yeah, and then just can get it. But now if I try to do the same with the user two, then I get the, exactly the same error as uh, Sergius uh, showed us previously. I just cannot have access to uh, the secrets in workspace 11 because I'm user two and I don't have access to this workspace. And of course, if we look in the corresponding config, we can really check that uh, user one token is used. So I can really access the workspace only from the user that created this workspace. Um, then let me, of course, if I create a second one here, and then use it yes if i use the second one sorry and then i create secrets no sorry yeah secrets 12 and then at it i would see both and not see the secrets so here again we can switch workspaces and have everything isolated as expected and if i come back to the previous workspace just with the typical this uh, use uh, dash uh, then of course I will get only uh, the first secret that exists in in the previous workspace and just last thing I will now create uh, a workspace for user 2 I can directly create the workspace to inherit from you know so inherit all the CRDs from the name of another of another workspace and directly use it. So now I'm directly in workspace two. And once again, if I create a secret here, and I get secrets, I don't see only this one. If I try to get the secrets from user one, I have that and even if I try uh, because I could try to you know um, use workspace two from uh, with the user one but then once again even the workspace two is completely unknown even in the list of workspaces from user one so things are completely separated and isolated I don't know if there are questions on this and of course then there is the kubectl kcp delete um, to delete workspaces, but obviously there would be additional work because for now you only delay the workspace object itself and not the content in it. So uh, there would be some work there. And so the last thing uh, based on what we had discussed is sharing, uh, obviously, <clears throat> which is not done for now, but would simply require adding uh, share sub resource on the virtual workspace implementation that would create the expected uh, cluster roles and cluster role bindings of type view, as Sergio has mentioned. And then obviously just add a, a, an additional 
subcommand to the kubectl plugin. Um, are there any questions? Or comments? <laughs> I had one random thing, but it was about kind of the beginning of this, where it looks like some of the workspaces are under a clusters like path. What's up with that? Is that just a cubism? Yeah, the thing is that for now, to access the logical cluster corresponding to a workspace, uh, this is mainly, I mean, the way KCP manages that for now is just that you access um, to the main KCP or the main shard um, API uh, URL plus slash cluster slash the name of the logical cluster, which is why when you do a kubectl config uh, current context, you see that then we point to the KCP directly to the KCP shard. Um, and the URL of the server is precisely the one with the cluster slash logical name, uh, logical cluster name uh, suffix. Does, does it answer? I mean, so that's that's just the way to um, point to the right logical cluster, to the right workspace inside the KCP shard. Does it make sense? OK, I think I followed that. I get confused with all the terms, but it's OK. We can keep going. Yeah, you can basically treat it as an opaque URL that if somebody was curious why it says clusters or why it says whiz bangs, you know, whatever it is, we could address that. But it it's not really meant to, uh, you know, it's not something that the user should care about. It's like when you get a URL to um, an elastic load balancer in in, in uh, AWS, like that's a weird uh, weird name, and it represents your. ELB, and as long as you know that URL, you're good to go. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense to me. Just, we're just putting it front and center in the CLI output, so that's why I was asking. Yeah, but, by the way, sorry. By the way, what I showed, uh, I showed kubectl config current context, but if you only use the KCP workspace um, kubectl plugin, then you don't see those names at all. I mean, what you, uh, the only thing you have to cope with is the workspace name. The and, context switch is done under the cover. Sorry. And and to and to echo Andy a little bit here is like I think um, this is like an important thing, which is breaking where a cluster is from like the, the idea that like oh you're talking to the cluster itself, um, and we're going to have existing tools and existing folks with that mindset who won't catch that. And like uh, the we found this like historically too with like OC is. Um, there's value in abstracting some of these concepts for some people and then other users are going to come in and be like no no no, i have to understand what this url means um and things like the kcp plugin right like that's one of the dangers of the layer above is that we get used to it and we're like oh it's obvious um but like to someone who doesn't want to have that layer installed and just wants to use cube control they'll come in and they'll say like oh that doesn't make sense i still just want to deal with cube configs and for people who are mostly dealing to a single workspace single cluster mindset um It'll be kind of the, we need to make sure that we do a lot of usability and experience work on people in the cube ecosystem who are used to the current way. Like they have to have something that isn't just like, we've made a layer that hides it. They'll need to break it down, right? Like uh, Kelsey doing Kubernetes the hard way, like breaking it down is an important thing. And then we'll have our useful things, which is once you've bought into that, or if you care and you're doing a lot of switching, you buy into something that streamlines it the best outcome is that most of that pushes down into something that like improves cube control. So like if cube control login worked better, right? Because you know the cube control login plugin was good, you'll still need some virtualization to go from a single place to a bunch of places. And someone has to discover that first place, but you're always gonna have to discover that first place. So like, this is an important part where like, think of this as like, as we ask questions and people ask questions like Rob did about like, well, what does the URL mean? We should be think, saying like, oh, we need to be able to explain and have good terminology for each of these things and what they mean. And then think about how we would explain that to someone new. And like, so like everybody in this group, I've seen do some of that process. Um, we have to keep doing it. Uh, and we'll, it, the longer we go down this, the more comfortable we're going to get it being like, well, it's obviously a virtual workspace implemented using inheritance of an underlying KCP instance. And people will be like, and they don't get it. So um, maybe that's like something we can encode into like the work 
the CLI docs, David is like, as we're talking about like the designs of these things, we need to be like, how do we, how do we clearly communicate this to someone? Like the, the doc should show the equivalent cube control command yeah. always. And we should also yeah. have a flow, which is like, if I'm doing this with pure cube control and we actually hold that mindset in our heads is like the pure cube control flow, it always exists. Or like we pick a couple of other examples like that. Um, the you know web browser flow and then the the streamlined yeah. flow yeah. is all about hiding that when you want that hidden and when you don't want it hidden we can explain you know like the DNS names that we pick for workspaces in a service or that we would expect someone who's setting this up for their own environment we're gonna have to make a recommendation that is an important yeah. recommendation is like here's what we recommend and here's why because that makes it easier for users to not have to ask these questions. Yeah, which is why also I tried to uh, manage everything by putting information in the typical um, cube uh, config file. Even the previous, I think, even the previous workspace is stored in the cube config in a quite you know standard way. So I mean, you can find back everything in the cube config and just use kubectl exactly the same way. I'm uh, interested to see that we're using the personal prefix for these workspaces in a sharded um, situation i'd imagine yeah. we'd have to resolve to the actual like if there's a translation happening between the name of the workspace in my personal virtual workspace and the actual name of the workspace across the kcp fleet i'd imagine that translation has to happen first and be recorded Otherwise, the personal workspace has to exist above the shard proxy. Well, I mean, for now, the personal workspace, uh, virtual workspace, is a completely different uh, URL. I mean, it's it's right. a, a, a distinct API server. I mean, it, it could actually be two different services fronting or two different implementations of proxies, um, and that's something that option. It depends on, I think, and some of it's going to be like a scale resiliency. So like we really haven't, as long as we're thinking single instance and like explaining it, we're okay. And then the moment we're like, hey, we want the shards to survive all other infrastructure failure. If we have that hard requirement, um, we probably need to then say, okay, well, what is, what is that? If the personal, if the list things fail, do they fail in a different way? And like the resiliency characteristics of running it as a service might actually point to one of those like, oh, we want to collocate with a shard proxy. Can I, can I change, is it a valid thing for me to say, oh, workspace one in my personal view used to mean this one thing and now it means this other thing? Is that a thing? That's, that's maybe, a, we should maybe ask, uh, is that going to be a use case people want to, like, uh, namespaces are not fungible because they're intended to be like unique identifiers that you can use with automation. Right. There may be value. I think there's probably still value for like you want that behavior somewhere that's non fungible, but it doesn't mean that we couldn't, you know, expose a feature like that at the higher level and say, yeah, like you can make your own views up. And then, like, yeah, you might have 15 different personal workspaces, each of which maps other names. Um, that's not a valid yeah. use case. We probably want to base that on someone saying, I really, really want to be able to rename this because X. When it came up in Cube, we actually concretely rejected it the original proposals were like hey we want to do everything the unique id this was kind of how google was doing it internally with um with borg identifiers and a number of other things and we said actually we think there's more value in the apply flow and config flow having static hard names that mean the same thing and if you delete and recreate them it means this um, that kind of conceptual weight existing users are going to come to us and expect it so like having a remappable thing also changes that and so we, we want to be able to like okay the cost the benefit of re, of allowing a renaming relabelable thing is worth explaining to someone what relabeling is i think that's and dns like does that right like nobody has to explain dns dns c names um that's another angle is like maybe dns c names would be enough to get some of this renaming that you want for workspaces uh, so we by should, the way we go ahead, sorry um, we already have the the pretty name management. I mean, when you're uh, when you point on the personal endpoint of the of, of the virtual workspace uh, that gives you the the, li your, the list of your personal workspaces, if you create a workspace one 
and there is already a workspace one uh, with the uh, workspace with the same name existing in the org. It will still be workspace one for you, but the um, object that is the corresponding shared workspace that is created in KCP would be workspace one with uh, you know a suffix something like that. But in your personal list of workspaces, you would still see the the workspaces as with the pretty names that you gave, and in all the interactions that you have. Uh, you manage them uh, like that. They, that's in yeah. I, I guess I'm saying like if we make so, that decision, we're adding another layer to the routing and and, and and you're you're we're making sure. So like we probably like and this is kind of like a uh, there's going to be a uh, what do we call this a winnowing function, which is we have a bunch of good ideas. Every every part of the thing has to like we're going to have to go through and winnow it down. So maybe like that's one like the mapping, which is like we should make a case for and against in the design doc around workspaces and say a use case justifies this, a flexibility, you know, some flexibility we believe we want justifies this versus it's conceptual. Because you could argue the cube config already gives us a remapping of the name of workspaces. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. DNS also. So it's like we should be able to weigh those trade-offs. You're right, Steve. Uh, and then the do we have we identified a canonical design doc that we're considering to be the uh workspace one or do we have a couple and can we consolidate down and give it an adr and say like this is the adr for workspace api and the set of features yeah, we, it supports we have the one where do workspaces live and we could promote yeah. that it has all the use cases and yeah place through them certainly use cases trade-offs like as yeah. we get more formal by adrs uh use cases trade-offs why we made the trade-off and what does it connect to and then that'll help us populate the grid so it'll be a great thing to do for workspaces yeah cool demo it's great to see it's great to see like all the flexibility here because like that experience of you know jumping between them is something that will do a lot admins will do a lot and users will do at least once and then maybe we need to like maybe and this gets kind of into like how far do we go on the feature side maybe we just need we need to be able to test and take feedback and say like here's all the things that people are saying when they try to use this um whether that's like you know, folks like app studio or it's uh, ourselves when we're trying to build some of these concrete examples so and also uh at some point too some of these we need to start making sure that we're uh distinguishing between uh idea like as we move out of prototype two, three, maybe this is like where we start getting more formal about like uh, what is a basic API we're going to test in isolation, and that's you know we expect to work for a long time. Which parts are going to be experimental, and what labelings we want. So maybe that's like another topic we could tee up for uh, you know discussion and a follow up is like um, yeah. starting to break things into levels of maturity and idea, implemented idea, basic prototype idea, and then something that like we're going to start carrying forward. All right, thanks, David. That was really neat. Thanks. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind stop being sharing, I'm going to reshare the um, agenda. And I think there's, let's see where I am here. All right, we don't have anything new, so I would like to pick back up real quick with the prototype three demos here. Um, I don't know if anybody has made any updates to this. Um, I was on vacation until last night, so uh, I have not been checking this document, but uh, I, I know from talking with Paul earlier today that we do want to uh, just reconcile everything here, get it uh, established, agreed upon, and then uh, Paul has graciously volunteered to take what's in here and translate it into appropriate GitHub issues that we can link to the proto prototype three milestone. So uh, does anybody have any comments or questions on what's in here since our last meeting when we talked about this? I did have a, a suggestion that if, if we agree on the, the demos that we're doing here, 
uh, it might be advantageous rather than me poorly translating work items like I did last time, that if we could put some, some names beside each one of these demos and say, hey, these are the people that are kind of uh, leading this demo. And if you can help us narrow it down to what's the ex executable tasks and what's like Clayton was saying, the bare minimum we need to accomplish the objective of the demo to help us scope it at the right level. I don't know how the group feels about that. Sounds reasonable to me. Anybody else have an opinion? Quiet bunch today. <laughs> All right. Um, well, maybe what we can do offline is, um, Paul, you and I can go through and talk to folks uh, in, individually and, and see if we can get some names here and start working on getting those tasks created in GitHub. Yeah, we've got the what, transparent multi-cluster, an API end user demo, an API author demo, and a KCP admin demo. Like, does any any of those jump out to somebody to say, yeah, I know I want to help with this one? Um, I think I'd like to be involved in the two API ones, uh, given the work that I did previously with getting CRD inheritance working. I'm happy to do the same. I can have you. You can start working on those or other way around. We can sync. Yeah, and I see Steve uh, volunteering as well. Yeah. And y'all are certainly welcome to add your names after the fact if uh, if you don't speak up right now. No worries. And the, the last one, can you scroll down? If there's nobody. So yes. I'd like to help Steve, maybe the two of us. Okay. We will find somebody. Yeah, and I see Maru, thanks for adding your name up here for Transparent Multi Cluster. I'm going to volunteer Jason. <laughs> I know he's, uh, I don't believe he's here at the moment, but uh, I know he was working on, on Transparent Multi Cluster before. The last yeah. one, it was, well, I was working on the location and those objects. Perhaps I can help there. Sure. Yeah, the KCP admin. Yeah. And then maybe as our goal is, if we can review the tasks that are in prototype three in our next community meeting, that'll be good for us to just kind of summarize because that's the first week of February, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so between now and then, we should independently meet and make sure that we have items in GitHub to cover these things. I did also want to plug something that was mentioned earlier about documentation is that it's since we're finishing prototype two it's a good time for us to revisit what our first entry experience is into the repo so it's a good time to revisit maybe our readme files make sure we've got whatever demo we're going to post out there and, and linked well and uh, maybe an faq to address some of the questions like what's there what's not there i created this uh issue for that if anyone wanted to pick it up Um, yeah, I think that's a great idea, Paul. Um, I know, uh, for example, Maru is new to the community. So um, Maru and anybody else who uh, is new, if you've got some suggestions for how to improve some of these things, those would be certainly welcome, um, as well as anybody else who's been around for a while. Um, let's definitely try and get that done before the end of the month. So I don't see anything else over here. We've got about nine minutes left. Um, I think it might be a good time to end a little bit early unless there's any last minute topics. All right. Thanks, everybody. See you next week. Thanks, all. Bye. Bye. Bye.